But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross, the message of the cross, um, or it perhaps reads better, the word of the cross. All meaning, of course, uh, the same thing. Paul is writing, of course, to a congregation that is um, in disarray. Uh, There are dissensions amongst them, uh, divisions. Um, He deals, of course, with all kinds of um, issues, pastoral issues, uh, immorality, and uh, all all the way through, of course, to uh, the end of the book uh, where he deals largely with um, uh, the resurrection of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, of course, um, uh, at the outset, uh, here in chapter 1, well, he speaks here about the the preaching of the gospel, which, of course, is the the main reason for which you might say that God uh, has left his church here on earth. It's our business, our sole business, preaching not the social gospel, but the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified, to a perishing world. I recall I remember many years ago now uh, when I was studying theology at um, uh, Brentarian in South Wales um, uh, one of our uh, 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 teachers, Mr. Harrison he asked the class of would-be preachers he asked us what was the main focus, what was um, what did you see as the main focus um, of your ministry. And so he went round the class one by one, and of course, one after the other, uh, they all um, repeated just about the same phrase, to teach God's people and to build up the flock. About halfway around, he stopped and he said, no, 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 he said, you're wrong. He said, you are all wrong. The main, the primary focus of your ministry, he said, is the salvation of souls. The preaching of the gospel. From that, we must never get away from. In verse 17, he has uh, people who are, you might say, preacher chasers. You know, followers of preachers. I follow this one, I follow the other. Oh, so and so, he hasn't baptized as many as Paul or as Cephas, and so it goes on, and of course continues on even to this day. Paul, he says in verse 17, uh, Christ didn't send him to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Uh, he's not decrying uh, the sacrament, the ordinance of baptism, that's very, very important. But he focuses on the primacy of preaching and the primacy of the preaching of the gospel. Because um, it's, um, baptism is dependent upon the preaching of the gospel. Without the preaching of the gospel there's no baptism. And so he focuses on the primacy of preaching, the preaching of the gospel, as the primary means of grace. The means by which God's saving grace comes to sinners. Baptism dependent on preaching. But the measure of the preacher is not the amount of followers he has. The measure of the preacher um, is not how many many people he has baptized. Uh, The measure of the preacher is the gospel the message that he brings. It's not his cleverness, his smartness. It's not his eloquence, his brilliance as a preacher. It's the gospel. It's the gospel that he brings. He might be a very plain, ordinary preacher. Maybe stammering lips, as it were. Um, he may be even very, very difficult to listen to. Some men, I I declare, are easier listened to. The content, what he says, whoever he is, whatever you think of his gifting, what he says, the content of the message, that's what's important. 
And for we who would listen to him, our task, our task is to listen. And that's hard work. Listening is hard work. But we live in a day and generation in the West today that doesn't like hard work. We like everything easy. We want everything laid out for us on a plate. And so you see churches and church leaders, they move away from the preaching of the cross. They move away from Paul's kind of preaching because they want, they know that people don't want to work hard. They want to, they want everything easy. They want it palatable. So that's how they seek, as it were, to dress it up and present it to men and women. Dr. Breckenridge, a Presbyterian minister, way back in the day in North America, he'd been away for a week. At an assembly, returned to his own church on the Sabbath day, where he had a visiting minister take his place, because he'd been away all week. And this young man preached three times on that Sabbath day. And um, at the end of the day, one of the members of the church said to Dr. Breckenridge, that must have been a delightful rest for you, sir, he said. And Breckenridge replied, he said, rest? Rest, he said? He said, I am worn out, he said. It's hard work listening to those three messages and seeking to understand them. But that's not, people, that's not what people come to church for today, is it? Easy, easy. Everything must be easy. Don't make too much demand upon them. So it's the measure, the preach, you measure the preacher by the gospel that he brings, the content that he brings. So Paul, he says in verse 23, we preach Christ and him crucified, not making it palatable, not, not dressing it up, not tailoring it for certain people, thus by uh, emptying the message of the word of the cross, emptying it and making it void. That's the wisdom of words that he speaks about. That's the lie um, rather than the truth. Because the wisdom of words is man's word. Man's making it or seeking to make it palatable, taking the edge off of it, embellishing it, you know. Um, over against that which the message of the cross, the word of the cross, that which God has spoken. But today, you know, we want the hearers to remain comfortable. We want them to be entertained in a measure. We want them to be pleasured and we want them to go home feeling, well, feeling good about themselves. So, the Instead of the plain, unembellished message of the cross, that we acknowledge alarms and disturbs people. And the police officers come uh, to me on the street when I'm preaching, they, they say to me, you're not allowed to alarm or distress people. That's against the law, they say. And I, th I don't say it to them, but I think to myself, I smile inwardly and I think to myself, Sir, that's exactly what I'm here for, to alarm them, to distress them. To bring that conviction, only the preaching of the cross will do that, beloved. Bring them to that place of distress, of seeing themselves as God sees them. And to see their great need of Jesus Christ. That they need him more than they need to breathe. But the message of the cross, you see, is the message of man's sin. His utter depravity before God. And his impotence, his powerlessness to do anything for himself. It reveals Yes, it reveals God's love. It's the only place. Look where you will. The world over. Any nation, any city in the world you like. What do you see? People say, just tell them. God loves them. 
Okay, I tell them, God loves you. It just runs off them like water off a duck's back. So what they say? You say to them, God loves them. And they look around them. Where is the love of God? They can't see it. Nothing, nothing I tell you but the wrath of God. That's all you can see as you look out on the world today. Nothing but God's furious, burning wrath because of man's sin, apostasy. Only one place where you look and you see manifested the love of God, and that's in the cross of his son, Jesus Christ. That is the great manifestation of God's love in giving his son, his only begotten son, to die on that cross for lost sinners like we once were so it's judgment to the world the preaching that's with power the preaching that brings this alarm and distress this conviction and even conversion that preaching that preaching with power is not the easy is not the diminished is not the tailored is not the embellished but the plain, simple, direct preaching of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Yes, it offends. Yes, it alarms. Yes, it distresses. It's meant to do. But it's the only message, beloved, that saves. Nothing else will. Not words of wisdom. That's for sure. So point number one, the divinity of the word. The word of the cross, that is, the message of the cross. It's a divine word. Paul says, that's all he preaches. Verse 23. And then, of course, he's come, he's just come from Athens, from all the philosophers, all the clever guys, and and they've just mocked him and ridiculed him when he speaks about the resurrection. So he's come to Corinth, which is, um, well, just a den of iniquity. All kinds of um, wickedness abounds, just like England today. And he came with the same simple, direct message, the preaching of the cross. And if you turn to chapter 6 and verse 9, you see there, he gives us a list. I won't go through them all, it's not exhaustive. But he gives us a list of of the kind of sinners that the Corinthians were. They were vile. They were utterly vile, some of them. Thieves and drunkards and so on. All manner of uncleanness. And then in verse 11 he says, And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. How was that accomplished? How is there a church in Corinth in this den of iniquity through the preaching of Jesus Christ and Him crucified? That's how. And it's the content that explains the power. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The person of Jesus and his atoning death. Everything else, beloved. You can fill your church with with all means. Erect a platform and and set up a pulpit and electric guitars and all the rest of it. Entertain them. Sing for them. Dance for them. Do what you will. But it will not bring them to salvation. The word is the same as in the beginning, John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word, was the divine logos. God spoke. He said, let there be. Six days, six days, 24, literal 24 hour periods, no evolution at all. The word of God, yeah. Six days, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. And there comes into being... All that we see before us. The divine speech. He said let there be a cross. And there was a cross. The word of the cross. The message of the cross. Of course refers to the whole event. 
Because there has to be things happen in order to, for there to be a cross, there has to be the incarnation, the miracle of the, uh, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. There has to be that beautiful life that was ever lived, the most beautiful. There has to be his trial before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate. The world has to cry out, crucify him, away with him. And of course they all thought that they were doing it. This was their business. They were ridding themselves of this this preacher that um, they couldn't stand the sight of. They thought. They thought that they were doing it. But he was being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. They were doing God's will. But the word of the cross, you see, it refers to the necessity because sin had to be punished. The nature that sinned, he has to be a man. There has to be the incarnation, he has to be a man because the nature that sinned has to, has to be punished. But only God, he has to be God too because only God could bear the wrath and the hell that came upon the Son of God on that cross. So you see, it had to be the cross. God spoke the word. Let there be a cross. There had to be a cross. I had one North American preacher say not, not, not many days hence, he said, um, he said, well, I suppose, he says God could have had Jesus bludgeoned to death or stoned, but he, he, just, he, he decreed it would be a cross. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. It had to be a cross. He had to be hanged on the tree. He was bearing the curse of God, redeeming those under the curse. The perfect justice of God had to be satisfied. He's making his son a curse for us, that we might be redeemed from the curse, from the depths of his love for his people, from before the foundation of the world. For us he wills salvation, decreed salvation. And in that cross, the word of the cross manifested his love for sinners such as we. It speaks of his eternal predestinating love. In his son dying as a representative, as a substitute for us. Under the wrath of almighty God on our part. Full satisfaction for our sins, all gone and delivered from all the power of the devil. But God did not just speak about the cross, he said let there be a cross. And when God speaks things happen. When he says let there be light, there's light. Yeah. When he says let there be a universe, there's a universe. When God speaks things happen. And so, by his word, he brought into reality the cross. It was conceived in his mind, you see. Before the foundation of the world, the universe, everything in it, and everything that happens in all the world from beginning to end, God conceived it all in his mind, spoke it into being. And he has programmed it to run, and it will run for as long as he has decreed it to run. And when that time comes, that will be it finished. But he's conceived too in his mind the word of the cross. He said, let there be a cross to save my people whom I have chosen. Let there be a cross in order that my covenant of grace with them may be confirmed. Let there be a cross, he said, that their blessedness would be in the new heavens and the new earth with me to dwell with me for all eternity. And so, beloved, you see, whatever men, whatever churches and church leaders think about the message of the cross, Whatever they think, whatever they say, whatever they do. And the world expresses nothing but contempt for the word of the cross. And in doing so, 
And this, I, I warn you, I say, this is, what, this is what these church leaders who embellish, you know, who seek to make it palatable, who entertain instead of preaching the cross, this is, this is them too. They're expressing contempt for God and for His Word. When they despise the cross. But that's all that man was doing with the cross. In crucifying the Son of God. Oblivious. Totally oblivious that they were doing the will of God. They didn't grasp it. They didn't get it. They didn't want the cross. If there be the Son of God, come down from me. But beloved, rest assured, in 2021, right to the end of the age, it is the only word that will bring salvation to the soul of a man or woman. Get rid of this, and you get rid of salvation. Secondly, the power of the word. It reconciles. It atones for sin. It propitiates. It takes away God's wrath from off of us. It justifies us. It makes us right with God. And it needs to do because naturally speaking we're not right with God. We're the very opposite. We're ungodly, unholy, unrighteous. We're conceived in sin. We're born in sin. We live in sin. We die in sin. Unless by the grace of God through the cross we're saved. The word of the cross is, it is finished. Done. God spoke and salvation came into existence. A perfect righteousness, a perfect satisfaction for his justice. And death and the grave and hell are drained Of all their powers. And the serpent's head is crushed. Just as God promised it would be. Genesis 3 verse 15. But the word of the cross. Paul tells us. The word of the cross. Is foolishness. It's folly to those who are perishing. Foolishness they say. Nonsense, they say. The work of God is foolishness. The work of Jesus Christ in his dying love, they say, is is fully, and his salvation, it's all foolishness. Evidence, of course, that they're perishing, that they're on the pathway to perdition. But what they're saying, of course, is, it's God who's foolish. It's his son who's foolish. All of it, salvation, eternal life, it's all foolishness, they say. Nothing that any church can do, that man can do. To make the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ palatable and attractive to a natural man or woman. That's why they want to embellish it. That's what they, they want to dress it up. That's why they want to get rid of it. That's why they'd rather sing to you and dance for you. Because it's not palatable. It's not attractive to a natural man. It condemns him. Her. And so they say, well, your God... Uh, I love it, I hear it all, I hear it just about every day on the street. Your God can do this to his son? And you tell me he's good? Huh? You say God wills and controls all evil? And, and you look at the world? He's not good? It's ugly, it's cruel, it's stupid. How could a man who 2,000 years ago died as a criminal on a cross, how could, how could he possibly be a saviour? Well, 
Well, says Paul, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They'll never see it. They'll never believe it. Until that is, through the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified, God opens their eyes and removes the blindness. And they see and they behold. Truly, this is the Son of God. And all that flows from the cross, it's all, fall, it's all foolishness. It can accomplish nothing, they say. And so thus they progress, progress in perishing, perishing. Yes, everlastingly, eternally, they shall perish if they're not saved. But meanwhile, even now, Perishing. Look around you in your own society. They're perishing in their minds. They're perishing in their bodies. They're perishing in their souls. They're perishing now. And why they need us to preach the cross to them. Because that's their only hope. That's their only hope. Else they'll perish finally and forever but you have to understand it's not grace it's not grace to them all for some for some it's the affirmation of their death sentence Paul says in 2 Corinthians he says for we are unto God a sweet savour of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savour of death unto death and to the other the savour of life unto life. Yeah? Have to understand that. The cross divides the human race. The whole, the entirety of the human race comes to the cross. And as a dividing point in history, in God's history, the goats go to the left, the sheep go to the right. The preaching of the cross, it's divisive. It separates. But just as God proposed and controls the cross, so too He controls the preaching of the cross. Because the word of the cross is particular. My sheep, they hear my voice. And they follow me, says Jesus. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. My sheep. The mighty power of God to destroy the wisdom of the wise. To save a particular people. Yeah? And it does not, and it will not, and it cannot fail. It will accomplish God's will. And that's why we, that's why you must continue, as Paul in verse 23, to preach nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because nothing else brings souls to salvation. The word that saves, thirdly and finally, that saves us, says Paul, us to us, we, we who believe that is, by the active work and ministry, of course, of the church in preaching faithfully with faithful, biblical, lively preaching of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But also, of course, in conjunction, the active working ministry of, of the Holy Spirit. Through the word of the cross, He brings that conviction that Jesus promises that He will, convicting them of, of, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That which well, the preacher himself cannot do. At bringing conversion.
but it needs to be the, the absolutely clear presentation of the, the message of the cross. Because it's the same word, you see, it's the same word, the word of the cross that destroys the sinner's self-confidence. And that needs to be destroyed. That needs to be shredded. Their own self-righteousness. You see, this, this is what the cross alone does. It shreds our self-righteousness. Because they all think they're okay. They tell me day after day they're okay. I don't need this, man. They're erecting their building. Now, even as I speak, they're they're erecting the, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of man without God. No need for God. They're laying the foundation for the Antichrist's coming. It's the same word of the cross, you see, that convicts them of their sin and of their need. Many others, of course, and many. It results in resentment, rejection, refusal. But be assured, beloved, It is in Christ, beloved in Christ. It is a word of the most tender love. The love of God for lost, ruined sinners who have raged all their lives against Him. Who are born in sin and shapen in iniquity and live with their fists and their maker's face all their day. The overtures of his love to heal you, to mend you, to reconcile you to him, that you would know his everlasting love. Shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. It's a message of help. You need help? Here it is. Sometimes, sometimes that's all it is. Sometimes that's all that's needed, you know. Help. I, I remember years ago preaching in the city of York. It didn't seem like too bad a place to me back then. You wouldn't have likened it to Sodom and Gomorrah, like, you know. And the church that I was work, working with there in the city of York... Uh, they told me about this, this, this young man, he just left home. He, he, was, uh, he was the son of a man. He just left home, is yet unconverted. Uh, he, he just left home and, and he come to the city of York to study at the university there. And his first night in the city, he's walking around the place, looking around, you know, his new dwelling place. And his heart, It's just breaking, just falling apart. And he's saying, he's weeping and he's saying, how am I going to, how am I going to deal with all this evil? And his heart just broke before the Lord and he was converted, saved. He just needed help. Jesus. Yeah. Healing. Healing. Because we're just so broke, we break ourselves with sin in so many ways. Comfort, hope, salvation, life from the dead. For us, us, says Paul, us, we who believe. That's present progressive tense as well. We who are believing. And go on to leaving. Because that's what they were appointed for. Unconditional salvation. Not appointed because God saw that they would believe. But because he appointed them. Unconditionally. To salvation. But in eternity. Brought to salvation a salvation brought into being because 
of the cross. All sealed there at the cross. All done. There God spoke the word of the cross. And it was done. And his son cried out, it is finished. And then afterwards, three days later, God spoke. He said, it is finished. Right, raising his son from the dead. Justified. Justified. Raised. Justified by his resurrection from the dead forgive them he spoke the word of the cross forgive them go purchase the gift of the Holy Spirit for my people go establish my covenant of grace with them a covenant of friendship, a covenant, a bond of love that is inviolable, that is unbreakable. And it comes to them, it comes to them by the means of preaching, the preaching of the cross, foolishness to those who are perishing, but it comes to those who are believing. They hear the preaching of the cross. They must, at some point in their history, somehow, by some means, in a church, on a street, a mystery. However, they hear the message of the cross. And God declares powerfully their justification, their forgiveness, sanctifying, cleansing them. Look at the, the verse 30 at the end of the chapter. But of him, of God that is. Not you, not me, not us. Of God, of Him. Are ye in Christ Jesus? He puts us into Christ Jesus. Grafts us into His Son. Yeah. Who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, that's our justification, sanctification, separated from the world, separated unto God, and redemption, that's the whole thing finished, done and dusted. Uniting us to his son forever. Forever. Grafted into his son. And our burdens are lifted. We are saved. And we are being saved. Again progressive. He begins the good work. And he sees it through to completion unto the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1 verse 6. And there, in the wisdom of Jesus Christ, yeah, Paul says, this is why, understand, please, this is why Christ did not send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And why the preaching of the cross must be central in the church. Today, in this modern technological age. Yeah. Because the heavens declare the glory of God. But the cross of his son Jesus Christ declares the glory of his redemption. That's the only place you find it. That's the only place you'll see it. And so, in the humility of faith, as he humbled himself, you too must humble yourself. In the humility of faith, you bring all your sins, all of them, and you bring them to the foot of the cross and you, you leave them there because if you mean business, you're not taking them away again. You're finished with them. Forever. Okay. You leave them there for Jesus to deal with them. To take them away. With all your guilt and all your shame. 
And then, from that point on, you walk in covenant friendship with God. Secure in the knowledge, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7, secure in the knowledge, again progressive, continuous sense, that the blood of his son Jesus Christ cleanses us and goes on and on cleansing us from sin until we be saved to sin no more. Amen.